So welcome to those that are just joining us. We are uh, just going to allow about a minute or so for the attendees to trickle in here. Um, I know many of you are just joining us, so uh, welcome, welcome. Uh, feel free to just settle in for a moment here. Uh, we'll get started shortly. Great, and thank you for those that are just joining us. Uh, we're just going to allow about a minute more to allow the rest of our registrants to uh, join in here. We'll get started momentarily. Okay, great. Well, it seems like uh, we have most folks trickled in here, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for your patience here while we get uh, things rolling here on the Zoom webinar. But hello and uh, welcome to this Second Nature webinar on a disruptive new approach to carbon offsets, uh, Climate Vault and Vanderbilt. My name is Alex Maxwell and I'm a Senior Manager of Climate Programs here at Second Nature and also the moderator for today's webinar. Uh, and before I start by introducing our speakers, our panelists here today, uh, I would like to just take care of a few housekeeping issues. Uh, so first, just so that you are aware, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, and after the webinar, you'll receive a link to the recording via email um, so that you can watch it again or perhaps share that out with colleagues as well. Um, during the webinar itself, all of you as attendees um, will be muted. However, you will have the opportunity to ask questions of our panelists um, over the course of this webinar. And you can do that by using the Q&A uh, function on the Zoom toolbar there. Um, these questions will be collected and then curated throughout the webinar and then asked of our panelists at the very end during our Q&A session. Um, please note, we also have the chat window enabled as well. Um, if for any reason you're experiencing technical difficulties during the webinar, uh, my colleague Mia is also on the line uh, and will message you directly to uh, help troubleshoot any issues uh, that may arise. Uh, but now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Uh, so today I'm very excited to be joined uh, by Dr. Uh, Michael Greenstone, who is the Milton Friedman Distinguished Service Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago, and also the founder of Climate Vault. And today I'm also joined by Mr. Eric Kopstein, who is the Vice Chancellor for Administration at Vanderbilt University. And uh, I will kick it over to Eric to get us started uh, with the very first presentation here. Eric, feel free to take it away. Okay, well, uh, thank you, uh, Alex, for that introduction. I truly appreciate the opportunity to be at this event today. I really appreciate all of you who um, tuned in. So Alex, can we go to the next slide? One more, please. Okay, well, yeah, I just wanna start by saying we all know that there is overwhelming you know, scientific consensus that human activities are driving climate change. There are all kinds of studies that attribute both incremental change and extreme weather events to human activity. And we also know the outcomes from climate change are potentially cataclysmic. So this is a, this is a big topic. Um, I'm also sure everyone on this call is familiar with the type of information here on this slide. Uh, the Princeton Review data, however, does tell us an important story. It tells us here that high school students care a lot about a university's position on sustainability and students consider this when they make choices about college. Uh, there's similar data that demonstrates the same things when undergraduates are completing college and they're thinking about joining the workforce. Uh, they think about the commitments to sustainability that potential employers have. So this to me um, is an example where our business interests as a university really intersect with sustainability. It's a topic we have to pay attention to. Um, it's critically important, I think, in and of itself, and our stakeholders and especially our students simply expect Vanderbilt to exert leadership on the sustainability front. So next slide, please, Alex. We created a campus master plan that we call uh, Future VU 
And we started back in 2014. And really from the onset, we wanted to establish for our campus, what is our true north? And that was really achieved through a set of guiding principles developed with broad input from our community and our stakeholders. I'm not gonna read all of these, but you know, with all that in mind, you can see uh, that sustainability is identified as a core objective for the Vanderbilt campus. Um, I'll also say the university's sustainability goals really are a collaborative effort, um, including administrators, faculty, staff, and students. <clears throat> and they fall again under this future VU framework, which is a holistic planning process for developing spaces on campus and investing in initiatives for the people that live, work, and learn um, <clears throat> in our campus environments. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so here we see a quick high level overview of Vanderbilt's current greenhouse gas footprint. Um, I didn't use the typical uh, typology here. I called them buckets uh, in this case. And in this parlance, you know, bucket one comes from our purchased electricity that represents 25% of our emissions. Bucket two, which is 45% comes from our buildings, you know, fuel used by our power plant, refrigerants, et cetera. And bucket three comes primar primarily from <clears throat> vehicular travel, air travel, and waste. And so to mitigate and eliminate our greenhouse gases, Vanderbilt, like all institutions uh, and companies, has to deploy a wide range of approaches. And we pivoted years ago to not just quantifying our footprint, but, but, but determining how we move forward uh, quickly and with determination. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide is a just a brief overview of some, but not all, um, of the steps that Vanderbilt has taken really this century that contribute to making our institution more sustainable. Once again, I won't read through all of these, but I'll call out a couple of examples. Um, we started publishing annual greenhouse gas inventories as early as 2008. We established earth-friendly move-in days back in 2010. Um, we decommissioned our coal plant in 2014. I remember when I arrived at Vanderbilt in 2012, the most highly visible and tallest structure on our campus was a coal stack. And I asked, why is that? <laughs> a couple of years later, we had moved to decommission that, which I'm proud of. We finalized our future VU plan that I mentioned, and that really emphasizes uh, sustainability as a key objective for Vanderbilt. <clears throat> so next slide. But you can see we plan to do more. And here, um, I think setting goals, you know, really having established goals, I think institutionally is really important because it gives an institution something to strive to achieve and something that can be measured and reported out transparently to the community. And so like many other institutions, we announced some bold goals, carbon neutrality by 2050, zero waste by 2030 is just a couple of examples. Um, and you can see on these slides, some of the things that we're doing to accomplish those initiatives. And I'm gonna call out just one. Um, one recent initiative I'm particularly proud of involves a tripartite partnership between Vanderbilt, the Tennessee Valley Authority and Nashville Electric Service through which we created a large scale renewable energy program called Green Invest. And through this program, 100% of Vanderbilt's electricity will come from renewable sources by 2023. And the program, it was not only designed to meet Vanderbilt's renewable energy goals, but it's available to companies and institutions across the entire TVA region in the Southeast. And it's going to serve to accelerate, uh, accelerate the carbon reduction efforts of Vanderbilt and as well as various other entities in the region. It's really gonna accelerate the overall greening of the TVA grid. So that's, a, that's an initiative I always like to just kind of mention. Next slide, please. And so, you can see at Vanderbilt, we're proud of our accomplishments on the sustainability front, but <clears throat> we're not satisfied. So again, proud, but not satisfied. So Vanderbilt's publicly stated goal in 2019 was to achieve carbon neutrality by 2015, or by 2050, excuse me. And the Vanderbilt community really applauded us for making that statement and for the actions that we're taking. But there was another message that came out that was also very loud and clear. How do we move faster? So, you know, with that critically important question in mind, we are actively exploring a variety of ways to reach our targets much more quickly. And these explorations led us into, you know, really several areas, one of which is 
carbon offsets. So next slide, please. <clears throat> So while we continue to accelerate and undertake interventions on campus to reduce Vanderbilt's carbon footprint, all of which, as you know, take time to implement, we're still producing a lot of greenhouse gas each year. And this is obviously where carbon offsets can come into play. And so for quite some time, and with input from constituents across campus, faculty, staff, students, we've been dialoguing about different kinds of carbon offset programs. And as we contemplated various programs, the internal dialogues really inevitably centered around the key attributes of offsets, um, verifiability, additionality, permanence, enforceability, et cetera. And while we looked at a range of potential approaches, our institutional community was really having, frankly, a difficult time reaching consensus on what to recommend due primarily to questions around the potential credibility and transparency of many offset programs. So while those dialogues were happening uh, over time, uh, probably about a year ago, I learned about Climate Vault and several things immediately attracted me and then subsequently our chancellor and many other members in our community to embrace what I think is Climate Vault's really innovative approach. So I'm gonna end there and turn it over to Michael. He's gonna provide now a more in-depth overview of Climate Vault's uh, approach. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eric, and thank you, Alex, and thank you, Second Nature, and everyone uh, for allowing me to participate today and talk about Climate Vault. So let's see if I can successfully uh, share a screen. And okay, can people see my screen? Okay. So I'm gonna talk about uh, Climate Vault, which is uh, a new path that I think can help uh, to carbon neutrality that can help higher education institutions achieve uh, their various climate goals. Uh, we have really two uh, goals uh, that we were aiming for with Climate Vault. And I think both we have found to be really, make just a perfect pairing uh, with Vanderbilt. Uh, the first is to help higher higher ed institutions, organizations, and individuals to reduce their carbon footprint. That's uh, kind of straightforward. And the second is to help foster innovation in carbon removal. Uh, All right. oh. Sorry, Michael, to interrupt. I think we're uh, having a problem seeing you advance the slides again. Okay, so that again. we're going to try that again. Sorry about that. Uh, how's now? That looks great, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, and the second goal is to foster innovation in carbon removal. Uh, carbon removal is a kind of broad category of technologies that help pull carbon that's already in the atmosphere out of the atmosphere and dispose of it in a way where it, it uh, can no longer contribute to uh, global warming. So let me try and talk about those two goals and what uh, Climate Vault does. Uh, the first is just playing off of what Eric said. Uh, there's just no question that uh, there is more and more pressure, and rightly so, uh, both from students uh, who believe that uh, climate change is the single biggest issue that the world faces today. Uh, it's also true in the investment community. There's, it's kind of, you, the numbers are so large, you can't quite believe it, but there's now, you know, this tidal wave of ESG funds, and there's been a 400% increase in investor assets in ESG sustainable index funds. Uh, and then there's also been a large increase uh, in products that are uh, marketed as being good for the climate or at least not bad for the climate. And so I think what we are at is at this really unique moment where there is frustration with governments around the world. There's frustration with the progress that the world has been making towards climate change. And you see people and organizations like, like Vanderbilt uh, who kind of want to take matters into their own hands and make a contribution. Uh, and what can be challenging uh, is, it, is this new market develops is there's all this demand for doing something, but the su available supply, uh, that is ways to reduce, uh, ways to reduce your carbon footprint, have not always been up to the task. Uh, and I think Eric was referencing some of this when he talked about some of Vanderbilt's internal discussions initially. Uh, a very traditional way 
uh, has that people and organizations have used is through programmatic offset. They often take the form of uh, trees uh, or tree projects, uh, afforestation uh, or reforestation, or sometimes methane capture, even cl clean cookstove programs. But these programs have been around for about 25 years. Uh, and uh, I think what I find surprising uh, is that people act like there's a scandal, and there's, this is a recent article in Bloomberg Green, uh, that these programs have failed to deliver in, in terms of their promised CO2. But what I find surprising about it is that scandal has been around since the advent of those programs. And you know, I think we all have to keep working to find better ways uh, to make these programs work. But in the meantime, they're often failing to deliver uh, the promised CO2 reduction. And that leaves the organizations that use this approach to offsetting you know, open to criticism or failing to deliver on what their uh, what their goals are. Uh, so, in the face of that kind of uncertainty, uh, of you know, there's all this demand building up, and then there's a question of like, well, what what should I do as an organization? Uh, and you know, how many tons should I do? Uh, and uh, what's the right approach to reducing my carbon footprint? And uh, the we, we started Climate Vault uh, to kind of help answer that question. Uh, and so it's a nonprofit that's dedicated to, as I mentioned, carbon reduction and innovations in carbon removal technology. Um, it was, I launched it uh, with three colleagues of mine, Andrew Daly, Bala Srinivasan, and Don Wilson, it was founded at the University of Chicago. Uh, and in very much the University of Chicago tradition, it is believes that we can use markets uh, to help solve this kind of social problem and do that in a very efficient way that does not cost more than is necessary. Uh, and so, as I've been saying, there's these two goals, carbon reduction, and carbon elimination. Let me now describe how we go about trying to do that. Uh, the first is, and I'll just use Vanderbilt as the obvious example here, is Vanderbilt uh, had decided that uh, as Eric mentioned, that they uh, wanted to be carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, they had a problem, which is that you can't, uh, in many instances, you, there's just not easy ways to go all the way to carbon neutrality. Uh, and so their choices were to stick with a goal in 2050 or uh, to find some other way. And what we offered was, uh, hey, count up how many tons of uh, CO2 you're responsible for and make uh, a contribution, uh, donation to Climate Vault, and we will then take that donation and go into the existing, and I will talk about this in a second, cap and trade markets for CO2. And there's one in California, there's one in Quebec, and then there's one in the New England states called Reggie. Uh, and the way cap and trade markets work uh, is that the governments that run those cap and trade markets set an overall maximum allowable level of CO2 pollution. I'll just, you know, these are made up numbers, but I'll say in the case of California, uh, suppose that California has, uh, California has kept in trade, let's just suppose that their cap is a thousand tons of CO2. Uh, that means that that's the maximum that can be emitted uh, in the state of California. And they issue permits that allow people to pollute, but they only issue a thousand of those. Uh, and so in this example, where Vanderbilt wanted to reduce uh, their carbon footprint by a hundred tons, uh, Vanderbilt would make this donation to Climate Vault. We would go into the California cap and trade market, purchase a hundred of those permits and effectively outbid polluters for those permits. And what that does uh, is it lowers the cap because we're gonna take those permits and we're not gonna use them to pollute. We're gonna put them in what we call the, uh, the vault. Uh, and so in this very first step, we're offering an, an immediate, transparent, uh, inexpensive and verifiable way, verifiable because the state of California enforces the rules that underlie and require you to have a permit for every ton of CO2. And it kind of helps dispel many of the concerns that people have about the traditional programmatic offsets, specifically the verifiability. You get to free ride on the jurisdiction that is running that cap and trade market. You don't have to hire a consultant or someone else to count trees. Uh, and the second is you don't have to be an expert on where the cheapest ton of CO2 can be uh, found. Uh, you don't have to know if it's from a tree farm in British Columbia or Brazil. The whole purpose of these cap and trade markets is to find uh, the least expensive tons. So that's step one of what we do. Uh, step two is we have this second goal, 
uh, and that's to help foster innovation for new carbon removal technologies. And you know, this using the cap and trade markets uh, as a way to help reduce CO2 in the atmosphere is I, I think a good and powerful idea. But what the world really needs in addition uh, to effective policy uh, are is a development of technologies that don't exist currently. Uh, and I think there's two ways you can think that we're gonna get those technologies. One is you can sit around and hope. Uh, I kind of think that's like waiting for rainbows and unicorns and things like that. Or you can unleash uh, market signals. And that is you could set a price and say, hey, anyone who can produce this uh, carbon removal, that is who can remove carbon from the atmosphere, will purchase that. And so what we do in Climate Vault is we are accumulating all these uh, permits and we now have 550,000 uh, tons of CO2 in the vaults. Uh, and later this fall, we're gonna make up our first public offer, which is any company who is capable of doing uh, carbon removal in a credible way, uh, we will trade a permit uh, for a ton of carbon removal on a one for one basis. And the idea is that this will create, this will help launch the first large scale market uh, for carbon removal in the world. Uh, and in so doing, achieve the second goal, all the while remaining uh, faithful to our promise to Vanderbilt, which is in, in the cartoon example I gave, that Vanderbilt wanted to reduce their emissions by 100 tons. So we would effectively take those 100 permits that we had purchased with the proceeds from Vanderbilt and trade them for 100 tons uh, of CO2 removal. Now, an important, and so just to review how this works, uh, we've made this infographic, which I think can often be helpful. Uh, you could consider Vanderbilt donor number one, uh, and you could, uh, there's other higher, uh, the Swarthmore College and the University of Chicago have also made donations, and the, let's call them donor number two. Vanderbilt, uh, we bought X1 tons of CO2 permits, uh, for the other one, we bought X2, and then we're going to put them in the vault. Uh, oh, uh, sorry. And together, X1 plus X2 it equals Y permits. Uh, and then we will publicly offer, which we're going to do for the first time this fall, uh, to purchase Y tons of CO2 removal. Uh, and so there's this two-step process. The first, you start with the cap and trade markets. Uh, and then the second, you put them in the vault and then use the when enough of them have accumulated to purchase carbon removal. Uh, and so that's kind of our full round trip. Uh, I think an important question is, can you trust uh, that we're getting reliable carbon removal? Uh, and to do that, we put together what I think is really kind of a rock star Hall of Fame team of the world's leading experts to assess the technology of the companies that want to uh, that will respond to our offer. Uh, it's chaired by Ernie Moniz, who's the former U.S. Secretary of Energy. Uh, the other members of the committee are Sally Benson, who's at Stanford University, John Deutsch, uh, who uh, is an uh, institute professor at MIT, and in addition to being the former undersecretary of the Department of Energy, is also the former director of the CIA. Uh, Kathy Watecki, who is probably the world's leading expert on advanced terrestrial carbon removal. That's like, the, you read about the plants that have thicker roots and are able to suck more CO2 out of the atmosphere. Margaret Leinen, who's at Scripps, is probably the world's leading expert on using oceans for carbon removal. And Steve Pocala, uh, who's at Princeton, who's uh, another expert in this area. And so when companies come forward to volunteer to do this carbon removal, uh, they're gonna have to have their technology uh, vet it by this group, and then ex post, this group will vet that they actually did the carbon removal. Um, let me go to the next slide. Uh, we launched in May, uh, and so far we're off to a you know very fast start. Uh, there's a wide series of donors. Uh, Vanderbilt uh, is, is a kind of a hallmark donor for us. Uh, the Gemini, who's a cryptocurrency firm, uh, is, is another important one. The University of Chicago, uh, the Texas Pacific Group, the investment firm, DRW. There's uh, a wide range of firms and uh, institutions of higher ed uh, who have used Climate Vault uh, to decarbonize their operations. Uh, Climate Vault has, uh, so as I said, has so far has about 560,000 uh, 
uh, tons of CO2 in the vault. It's received a lot of attention uh, in the Wall Street Journal, Axios, Marketplace, uh, Bloomberg Green, uh, a, a variety of other publications. Uh, so let me close by saying there's three main ways that we uh, can work uh, with colleges and universities. Uh, the first is the way that we've worked with Vanderbilt, uh, that a college and university can decide that uh, they want to reduce their carbon footprint by a certain number of tons. Uh, and then we, uh, we, as I, we have this two-step process, and it costs about $14.50 uh, per metric ton to uh, reduce your carbon footprint using the cap-and-trade markets. Uh, the second approach uh, is one that we've worked at with a couple foundations, but we haven't worked with any universities yet on this, is that there's a lot of pressure on colleges and universities to divest from fossil fuels. And my own view on that is that that sounds very good and it's, you know, uh, it might feel good to remove, say, Exxon from the endowment. Uh, but if you put the acid test over the top of that, and I, I think that acid test is as a planet care, uh, it's unlikely, the planet is unlikely to care very much. And the reason is because someone else will purchase Exxon stock uh, and Exxon's total emissions will uh, you know, effectively be unchanged. And so an alternative approach is you just take the endowment as it is, calculate the number of tons that the holdings in the uh, tons of CO2 that the holdings in the endowment are responsible for, uh, and then use Climate Vault uh, to decarbonize the, the endowment. So as an example, if uh, the endowment owned 1% of GM, you would assign 1% of GM's emissions uh, to the endowment. And if you own 3% of Facebook, you'd assign 3% of Facebook's emissions. And that's how you would kind of pro rata calculate the number of tons that the endowment is responsible for. And it's not very expensive uh, to do that, surprisingly so. Uh, it's maybe about five to 12 basis points. So you could think of that as 0.05 to 0.12 percentage points per year uh, to decarbonize uh, the endowment. And then the third and final way that we can work with institutions of higher ed is there's a lot of demand from the employees oftentimes uh, to work at a carbon-free uh, uh, institution. And one way, so some institutions have are now offering as an employee benefit, either paid for by the employer or by the employee uh, in a tax preferred way, uh, to undo the faculty member or other staff members' uh, carbon footprint. And that's about $250 per year. Um, okay, so those are the three main ways. Let me close with uh, what I think are some of the advantages of working with Climate Vault. Uh, it's fast and it's easy in the sense that once a donation is made, you know, the next day uh, we can go into the cap and trade markets and uh, secure the tons. Uh, it's a nonprofit. Uh, we believe it's highly cost effective uh, for, uh, for a reliable offset. I don't think it's possible to get reliable offsets at this price. Uh, we're relying on government verifiability for free, free riding on the jurisdictions that offer these capital trade markets. And then in addition, there's this, I think, very important component, which is helping to spur innovation in this area that is absolutely critical uh, for the planet's future, which is carbon. Uh, so with that, I will close and happy to begin a discussion. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Michael. And thank you, Eric, uh, for those very helpful presentations. That was great. Um, I know we had a lot of questions coming in through, through the Q&A, and I would just put out to our attendees um, that that window is still open. Feel free to keep those questions coming, and we'll uh, curate those and get those in as we're able. Um, to kind of kick this Q&A session off, I was wondering if I could ask a question for really both of you, um, which some folks may be wondering, which is how, how does one even approach a partnership or, or start a partnership with Climate Vault? Maybe Eric, you can speak to that from your experience and maybe Michael, if you wanna elaborate on maybe how you've also worked with the other institutions you mentioned, your own of course, and, and maybe Swarthmore that's also made uh, donations as well to the vault. Um, it'd be great to hear kind of the mechanisms for starting that partnership with, with Climate Vault. Sure, well, I'll, I'll kick us off, uh, Alex. Thanks for the, uh, the question. So in Michael's slide, it said fast and easy. And in, in our case, it was definitely easy. It maybe didn't go quite as fast, but I'll explain how things kind of started. 
it started by, I had a colleague uh, here at Vanderbilt uh, who was interested in what we were doing on sustainability. I was kind of giving a broad overview of all of our different initiatives. And this person said, you know, have you been looking you know, at offsets and have you ever heard of uh, Climate Vault? And I said, yes, we've been looking at offset programs, but no, I have not heard of Climate Vault. And uh, this person happened to know uh, Dr. Greenstone and we made the introduction. So um, really, this was probably Michael a year ago or so. Yeah. And really what we did to start with was we, we uh, set up a Zoom meeting and I probably spent 45 minutes with myself and some of my team members walking Michael and members of the Climate Vault team through Vanderbilt's really goals and objectives. We explained a lot about really who we are, why this matters to us, uh, the path that we're on, et cetera, because we always like our decisions to be what I think of as values-based, and we like to work with organizations that share the same values, and we like organizations we collaborate with to understand um, and appreciate who we are. Um, so we went through that, and then uh, Michael and his team kind of walked through the Climate Vault approach. And I'm a little slow. It probably took maybe two meetings before it really clicked. The, the notion of going into the, the cap and trade markets was relatively straightforward to understand. Um, and we spent a lot of time talking about what I think is a really, really innovative part of this, which is once you go into those markets and you vault certificates, how do you parlay uh, the monetary value of those certificates into carbon reduction technologies and thereby spur a new market. Uh, once I got my head around that, and Michael and the team really explained the approach, which Michael just went over, that's when it really clicked. I'm like, I think this is really, really innovative and it's something we can do now. So the, you know, my point about fast, uh, I, wanna, I wanna say we're, we're a university. We like to be really collaborative. It's really, really important for us to hear perspectives from everybody. And I enjoy being a member of that kind of community. I've worked in higher ed my entire career. Um, but sometimes dialogues go on and on and on. And I also like to take action. And our community had said to us, you know, we want to see Vanderbilt uh, take further action. And while I became convinced pretty quickly, as did other leaders, that the Climate Vault approach was right, we, we certainly, before taking that bold step forward, wanted to communicate uh, with members of our constituencies. So, um, we met with our university sustainability advisory committee, um, which includes students, faculty, and staff. Michael and the team joined me. We explained the approach, and that was we had a really I, I will trust you, trust me a really robust uh, really robust conversation. Uh, met with our you know several of our specific undergraduate organizations. <clears throat> I've been explaining this and you know talking through it with various members from across the city and uh, who are involved in sustainability. <clears throat> so we took a kind of a methodical approach of like, hey, I think we have something here, but before we just dive right in, let's take some, let's take the necessary time to socialize that. And we did that over a period of really several months and then arrived at the conclusion uh, with support from the community that we move forward. Um, so it was easy. And as far as, you know, paperwork and, you know, what does it take to actually codify an agreement? You know, Michael and the team have relatively standard and straightforward uh, documents that one that quantify the amount of carbon that uh, Climate Vault will purchase on behalf of a donor from the regulated markets. And that was really just about all there was, you know, to it, in addition to working together to communicate um, to our community about um, what we're doing and why. You know, let me just add there, uh, when I said fast and easy, it's really fast and easy once an institution has decided. Uh, and one of the great appeals of working with Vanderbilt uh, and other higher ed institutions is exactly what Eric talks, uh, is talking about, which is the culture of questioning and tough questions uh, and trying to understand different perspectives. Uh, and uh, I think, Eric had me meet with the students at least twice. Uh, I will say uh, they were both enlightening experiences. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was, it was terrific uh, from our perspective uh, in the sense that it uh, helped us think about what we're doing new way and articulate what we're doing new way. And we are, you know, very open and look forward to doing that uh, with any other institution as well. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, being an academic, higher ed ones are the ones we're most excited about. But yes, uh, it is a 
process. And I think no one is going to just press a button and say, okay, this is great. Sign me up. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's one that we enjoy and look forward to. It. Great. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Michael. Uh, we had a, a couple of questions coming in kind of along similar lines. And I know part of this is covered in the um, uh, frequently asked questions doc that we tried to circulate in advance of this call, but I, I'm sure some folks are still maybe wondering exactly how this works. So the question is um, coming in, when you trade a permit from the vault to another entity in exchange for carbon removal, doesn't that take the permit out of the vault? Won't that permit now be used to enable the other party uh, in the transaction to sell that permit to another entity who can use it as an allowance to emit uh, that ton. Really what they're asking is, can you help me understand how uh, this is not taking carbon out of your vault? Yeah. So did it work that I shared screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Th that is a super important question. And this infographic is supposed to help, but it's one we're constantly trying to make better. So I think the way to think of it is, uh, let's just take Vanderbilt with their X sub one uh, tons that they wanted to get rid of. Uh, we're put, gonna put them in the vault. Uh, then when we trade them uh, along with the X sub two uh, for Y tons of carbon removal, absolutely that those carbon removal firms do not want a piece of paper. They need money to uh, invest and innovate and make their companies run. And so they will sell them back into the cap and trade markets. And what that means is that uh, once that full flywheel is working with the carbon removal, at the end, we will have left the, car, uh, the cap and trade markets unperturbed. They will have the same emissions that they would have, but uh, we will still have caused, from the planet's perspective, uh, there to be why fewer tons of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, and that's because the only way we would make that trade uh, is uh, if we're going to get carbon removal in exchange. And so it allows us to remain faithful to the promise that we made to Vanderbilt initially, which was to take their X1 and make sure that the atmosphere was down X1 tons of CO2. And it is, it's just that initially that's happening through the cap and trade markets. And then when there's a good opportunity for carbon removal, we'll just swap that for reduction uh, in, in, in uh, carbon removal. So that's a very, very important point. And uh, if I have failed to answer that in a clear way, please feel free to ask uh, the question again. Yeah, and Alex, let me just add to that a little bit. That was the question that myself and colleagues at Vanderbilt asked Michael and team in five or six or seven different ways to try to kind of walk around the, the topic. And part of the other underlying belief of the system that Michael uh, just explained so well is something Michael touched on earlier, which is, you know, carbon reduction efforts are obviously critically important, um, but carbon removal is also critically important for the future of the planet, right? So I really, once I understood that, yes, the carbon certificate, the pollution certificates come out, they have a monetary value that can be remonetized, if you will, and then frankly, turn back into pollution within the cap within a given market, but we won't let that happen. That monetization doesn't happen unless Climate Vault and its team of experts are convinced uh, and will have evidence that those dollars from that monetization of the vaulted certificates is going to result in at least as much uh, carbon removal as the volume of carbon that the certificates uh, represent. And I think that that to me, again, that was the real like, hey, taking the certificates out, that's a big immediate step. Um, but this notion, again, of parlaying that into things that I think and Vanderbilt thinks are really important for the planet, which is these carbon reduction technologies. I think that's what really distinguishes this, this approach. But it's, it, and it's a critically important question. It's one that we really had to get our heads around to be comfortable with this approach. Let, let me just add as further context, uh, you know, every single climate plan that's out there that has the planet sticking to two degrees or one and a half degrees C uh, has this kind of magical moment, if you look at the graphs carefully, where carbon removal starts taking off. And it actually starts taking off so much that by mid-century, the planet is negative emissions on that, which is whatever's being emitted is there's more being taken out with removal. And my view on that 
is like, there's two approaches. One, you can sit around and hope. Uh, I don't think that is often a very effective strategy. Or the second is you could like unleash uh, market forces and try and, you know, gin up as much carbon removal uh, innovation as possible. Uh, one other thing I want to add is I think oftentimes colleges and universities, uh, I think when I started Climate Fault, I, had, I, I didn't have a full appreciation of this, uh, are trying to achieve multiple things, uh, not just reductions in CO2, uh, but, uh, you know, maybe help spur the adoption of renewables or, uh, you know, some other goal that is complementary to the carbon reduction. And I think when I started this, and actually the conversation with Vanderbilt were really instructive for me uh, in fully appreciating, well, that's fine, but people want to achieve, do more than one thing. And I think this is, uh, you know, this is our answer to, hey, we can do more than one thing here. Uh, and we think this is very, very important thing uh, to do. Maybe, you know, more, probably more, in my view, more important than at this point, uh, spurring the deployment of renewables, which I, I, I think there's not a lot of barriers to doing that anymore. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Eric. I really appreciate you sharing both of your perspectives, the walkthrough uh, from the technical side, Michael, and then also Eric from, you know, someone sitting in a university, kind of how you were, how were you, you were wrapping your own head around that very important question. Um, so thank you for that. We also had a, a couple of questions about, um, okay, when uh, now you're moving towards uh, CDR projects uh, and the vetting and confirming ex post. Um, wondering if maybe, maybe Michael, this is a better question for you, if you could elaborate a little bit on uh, the rigor of the verification process behind, you know, selecting those projects. Um, and then there was a complimentary question to that, which asks, um, will those carbon offset projects that the Climate Vault is, is funding be made public? Can schools actually see what those yeah projects are yeah. before making a decision. Okay, so I apologize for it's like a bad parody of academics. I can only speak with PowerPoint. <laughs> uh, so my answer to the first question is, this is, uh, a, this is an enormous potential Achilles heel, which is, well, what if we just invested in, uh, and here Eric uh, has a very good natured person, and so I will make fun of him, but uh, I suspect Eric deep down is in his garage has some great idea for carbon removal technology. Uh, I think Eric has many, many great skills. I suspect uh, his technical engineering skills to produce carbon removal technologies may not be that great. Uh, and how do we avoid buying Eric's fake fly-by-night carbon removal technology uh, in that second step? And the answer to that is, uh, and we I thought about this a lot and then uh, and then I called my friend Ernie Moniz, who's the former Secretary of Energy, and I said, okay, here's what we're trying to do. This is the problem. We want to make sure that we don't end up looking like the forestry offset program where the tree burned down or the tree was never going to be cut down anyways or whatever. And Ernie said, okay, I can help. He's like, you know, I want to be part of this and I can help build a team of really the world's leading experts. And that's what this group uh, is meant to do. They, their job is to judge uh, the technology of the removal uh, at, up front, and then only approve payments to the company, let's say Eric's company, upon actually executing uh, the removal. And really, this is, is Ernie and I came up with five archetypes, like experts in particular areas that we wanted to have. And we had a number one choice, a number two choice, a number three choice in each of those categories. And no exaggeration, we got the number one choice in every single category. Uh, and so this was the best of the best that we could uh, come up with. And so the, the, it's a long-winded answer to, uh, you know, this is our uh, safeguard against buying Eric's uh, fly-by-night carbon removal technology. Uh, so Alex, I think there's a second part of your question, which in my efforts to make fun of Eric, 
I think I forgot. <laughs> uh, I think the, the, the double barrel question uh, ended with a question around um, the projects being made public. Oh, sure. And, and would schools Absolutely. be able to look at those? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So there's, uh, so I've learned a lot about, not, or more, I don't want to say a lot, more about nonprofit law than I ever had hoped to. Uh, and we will absolutely, uh, as we make these awards, make them public and it'll be very clear. Uh, but this is a, just like there's a donation to a university, the donor doesn't get to choose who teaches the class and things like that. So uh, you would, a donor would have a flavor of the kinds of projects that were being funded, but they couldn't say, oh, my dollars went exactly to that one. Uh, there's a phrase that I've learned from our lawyer, dominion and control. So the donors do not have dominion and control, but they absolutely would know the kinds of projects. And Alex, and gonna, just- oh, Sorry, oh. go ahead. Oh, no. Okay. Were you done, Michael? I was just going to- I was just going to say, we're going to do our first request for proposals uh, this fall. So. Yeah. You know, one of the one of the interesting things that occurred to Vanderbilt is we have a lot of great faculty. They also collaborate with a lot of great faculty at lots of other institutions across the globe. And we don't, you know, some of our faculty may in fact make proposals that get reviewed through the objective rigorous process. We have no leg up. But theoretically, some of that, that carbon removal um, technology, maybe some of those proposals that are awarded come from collaborations that include Vanderbilt faculty. I think that would be awesome if that were the case. There, there's certainly no requirement whatsoever, and I have no right at Vanderbilt to say, hey, we have some faculty with, with what I think is a great proposal. It's done through that objective, scientifically-based panel. Um, of experts, but um, <clears throat> you know, it's the kind of people. Yeah, there there are individuals at Vanderbilt who are really smart on this topic, and you know, I, I would love it. <laughs> I think it would be fantastic yeah. if some faculty from Vanderbilt in Chicago, for example, got together and came up with a with a with a great proposal. And we would it would obviously be terrific from our standpoint as well. A really excellent way to highlight the loop. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank, thank you, Michael. And thank you, Eric, again, for responding to that. Um, we had another question uh, come in. And, and Eric, I think this is mainly directed towards you, but uh, wondering if you could kind of elaborate on how Vanderbilt looks at offsets as sort of a suite uh, in, in a suite of options for achieving neutrality goals, right? We know universities will continue to emit greenhouse gas gases. Uh, and some folks question, you know, are, are you just looking at just offsetting everything? And you, I know you walked through a little bit of all the other things you're trying to do, but, you know, you talked about having a bunch of ambitious goals and wanting to accelerate. Um, and you're now maybe just getting into, into offsets, but might there be like a goal somewhere down the line to eventually get off of offsets? Yeah. You know, it's perhaps maybe unavoidable just now, but Curious to know um, kind of how, how you look at it and sort of the suite of options, if you will. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. And that was the other really, really central part, part of our Vanderbilt internal dialogue. You know, some people said, is this just a way for you to basically stop working on all those other things you're doing and just rely upon this technique to say you're carbon neutral? And the answer is, well, first of all, absolutely not. Um, you know, we very transparently have, you know, published what we're doing. Uh, we communicate uh, broadly with our community all the time. And I personally have been up front along with our chancellor to say, no, the offset program does not eliminate uh, all of our other goals and aspirations to become carbon neutral as quickly as possible. This is a bridging technique. And in fact, because that bridging technique costs money, you have to make donations to Climate Vault in amounts that relate to how much carbon you're trying to offset. That creates an economic incentive to accelerate your plans, right? So every year, for example, uh, I gave you I gave you a greenhouse gas footprint of a 158,000 tons in one of my slides, and that was our most recent annual count. Um, I also mentioned that in by 2022 and then subsequently in 2023, when two massive solar arrays in Tennessee come online, 100% of Vanderbilt's electricity will come from renewable resources. So all else equal, not, nothing is all else equal ever in reality, but let's assume all else equal, our carbon footprint by 2023 will be reduced by 25%. So all else equal, the amount 
of offsets I would have to purchase to be carbon neutral is reduced by 25%. And everything we do every year to further reduce that footprint makes us less reliant uh, on Michael's program. And you know, and ideally, it's not just again, it's not just about buying the offsets. I want to see them turn into carbon uh, removal technologies. So the way I've described that really important question to our community is: is this incentivizes us um, to move faster? And you know, I could go into a lot of depth, but I won't right now on some of the other programs. We have a lot going on on transportation and mobility that's really innovative in my view, working with our you know, Tennessee Department of Transportation and Metro Nashville, as well as a bunch of our faculty that I think is uh, kind of a, a, really can hopefully serve as a national model uh, over time. And uh, also I think the other major initiative is looking at how do we vastly accelerate the greening of our campus infrastructure. That's a very, you know, complex and potentially costly proposal, but likewise, there are market techniques that can be exerted there to be able to accelerate uh, those aspirations and deep exploration of that is underway right now. And as those come to fruition as quickly as possible, our footprint is going down, 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 and the amount we have to offset in any given year is there, therefore reducing. You know, if I could add one thing that Please I think uh, from actually working with the University of Chicago, who's also a donor, I think they originally saw this as just a way to reduce their carbon footprint. Uh, and they now are carrying it around as kind of like an internal pricing mechanism mm -hmm. uh, and say, okay, well, if we want to reduce it further, uh, there's a variety of projects we could do. Uh, some might do better than $14 and 50 cents a ton and we should absolutely do those. But the ones that are more expensive than $14.50 a ton, like we now have Climate Vault is, you know, inside the tent and can use them. And it's, it's kind of a way to help organize thinking about how to get the biggest bang for the buck. And I, I think when the conversation started with Chicago, I think since this was founded at Chicago, there was just some general goodwill and the thought that they should do something. Uh, and now I think they're beginning to see this as a way of sharpening their thinking about how to achieve the broader goals. That and, and Eric has described what the broader goals are at Vanderbilt, and you know, obviously, every institution is going to have its own set of broader goals. Great, thank you both. That was great. Um, we had a question come in at the at the very beginning of the uh, the webinar here, um, kind of zooming out in perspective here, and the question is without a national or even global cap and trade market, won't polluters simply move their industries elsewhere? Um, if we invest in buying up permits and regulated markets. And uh, Michael, I'm sure you've got some thoughts in response to that, but um, yeah. yeah. Listen, uh, the, I like to tease my uh, friends who teach at uh, Harvard's Kennedy School that there's like a Kennedy School version of the world. Uh, and that Kennedy School version of the world is uh, that there is some uber government across the entire planet. Uh, let, maybe it's the UN or something like that. Uh, that can set a uniform climate policy everywhere, you know, in Kazakhstan and in Mumbai and in uh, Saudi Arabia and Detroit and Fresno. And when you have that, exactly the problem that the questioner uh, was asking would disappear. You, there'd be no incentive for people to move around. Uh, and But until that happy day comes where there's uniform climate policy around the globe, this will be true of every single uh, a, a, a approach that people you are using to reduce their carbon footprint with why do i think it's uh not like a giant problem for climate vault well most of the regulation uh, uh most of the industries that are regulated in these cap trade markets are power plants they're not highly movable uh and uh it so that that, that is some insurance against us but i i, I you know, I can't say that there is zero uh, movement of economic activity uh, until my Kennedy School friends uh, are able to rule the world. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. I appreciate that response there. Uh, we have maybe time for one, maybe two more questions. I will say this. If your question did not get answered today, we will have record of these questions and we'll be able to synthesize them. And then Michael and Eric, if it would be okay, maybe I could ask those back out to you and we can you know, email those to, to attendees to kind of get to yeah. these questions. We know we just won't be able to answer in the time frame here. Um, but maybe if we could just get a couple more in. So another question 
coming in here about the criterion for looking at a, a CDR project. Um, so are you planning on publishing any of the criterion that uh, you might use to evaluate a CDR project? Uh, and then the kind of example given here uh, is a question around, will, will there be a plan to make sure that there aren't other environmental or uh, social programs that are being exacerbated by a particular CDR project? So are those other externalities there? Yeah, so there's actually a draft of that, which the uh, tech chamber, which is this uh, committee led by uh, former Secretary Moniz, uh, that is going to set out the exact criteria, and they will be published as part of the request for proposals. Uh, so that will all be public. Uh, and uh, yes, full consideration. It uh, you know it's not going to be okay to get rid of carbon here, but like do all kinds of pollution or some other uh, you know socially undesirable thing over there. Great, great, thanks. Um, okay, so uh, final question in, in here. This is uh, kind of kicking back over to the university side of things. So, you know, we've talked about donors, we've talked about uh, private institutions. Um, question is, have you had any discussions with public universities? What kind of uh, funding is used to make these donations? What's the financial justification? Kind of maybe looking more so through the lens of someone sitting in a public, public university. Yeah, so we actually have ongoing discussions uh, with one very prominent, uh, a pretty somewhat advanced discussions with one very prominent public university and some ones that are maybe less far along uh, with some others. And, you know, that's not for us to decide, but I think institutions, both public and private, are uh, feeling the need to uh, express their commitment to uh, doing something about climate change by reducing their carbon footprint. And, you know, so, uh, I think they're going to have different funding mechanisms uh, for doing that. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. Um, you know, we've received several inquiries, some that Climate Vault might send our way and say, would you mind talking to so-and-so and sharing stories of your experience? And that door is always open. So anyone on this call who's interested in talking with Vanderbilt more, the door is always open to that. We, we love talking with uh, with colleagues. So I know there's there's growing interest. I will say as a private institution, we do have greater flexibility in terms of broadly speaking, things like donations and procurement policies. So no doubt um, there are probably some more hoops that uh, public institutions may have to jump through. But I think at the bottom line, the story remains the same. Uh, we think at Vanderbilt that this is a important technique and we we still had to you know go through the dialogues internally and come up with our own plan for how we're how we're funding that and we worked that out and I'm hopeful that uh, public institutions will do the same. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate that comment there as well. So I know we're coming up on the top, top of the hour here. Um, so I just wanted to give uh, a moment of pause here to thank our, our panelists again and, and all of our attendees for attending this webinar. Um, just wanna give another gentle reminder here, a recording of the webinar uh, will be posted online, likely by tomorrow afternoon. There's usually a quick turnaround and you'll get a link to that posting and a follow-up email. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we know we also didn't get to all of the questions, but we will do our best to capture those, synthesize those, ask those back out to Eric and Michael and get some responses for you as well, which we can share via email. Um, and if for any reason you need additional information on Climate Vault, uh, and you're a member of our Climate Leadership Network or the UC3 program, uh, please feel free to reach out to me directly. I've included my email here, amaxwell at secondnature.org. Um, and just many thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Thank you.